Why would anyone choose to believe the Bible without evidence? Well, ask the crazies that do, and how they justify their insanity. Let's watch. Vadi Bauchem, and forgive me if I butchered that, is a Baptist preacher in Zambia and author of numerous apologetics books. This is part of a sermon, although I have no idea when or where it was given, but it demonstrates, once again, why the religious have such a hard time dealing with the non-religious, why they spend all of their effort preaching to the choir instead of trying to convert the heathens. Because these people have no good reason to believe anything that they do, and they know it. They know nothing they pretend is true would convince the skeptics. So here's why crazy people believe the Bible, and why no one actually should. Why do you choose to believe the Bible? I don't choose to believe anything. I accept things as true based on independent and objective evidence that shows that a particular source is most likely to be correct, and I do so provisionally, understanding that as new information comes to light, it may invalidate things that I've previously accepted. Belief, true belief, isn't subject to the will. You can't choose what you believe. You have to be convinced of it, right or wrong. Let me give you the answer, and then I'll unfold it for you from the passage of Scripture from whence it comes. Because telling us to believe a book based on what it says in that book isn't circular or anything, right? I mean, it makes perfect sense to accept something because that thing tells you to believe it. Oh wait, that makes no sense at all. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. That's entirely indefensible. We know that the people who wrote the Gospels, for instance, are not the people whose names appear on those books. We have absolutely no independently verifiable accounts from objectively demonstrable eyewitnesses, period. And it's interesting that for the non-eyewitnesses writing in the age of supposed eyewitnesses, these other eyewitnesses seem to have failed to have recorded what they saw in any way. There's no contemporary extra-biblical accounts of Jesus anywhere. They all appear in books written by people who were born after Jesus supposedly died, and all of the historians and well-known writers who did live during the time Jesus was supposedly around, people who would have been interested in his tale, had he been real, none of them ever recorded a thing. Imagine that. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. That's nice. I don't care what they claim. I care what you can prove. There are no supposed prophecies in the Bible which are specific enough to only refer to a single event. They are vague, if they are prophetic at all, and can be fulfilled by dozens or hundreds of possible events throughout history. This is why so-called prophecy has to be interpreted and can only be done after the supposed fact. That's why all end-of-the-world claims fail, because none of these imaginary prophecies are real. I know that look too. Yeah, that glassy-eyed look where you know nothing is going on in their head. They're just reacting emotionally and not thinking about it very hard, if at all. That's not a look to be proud of. That's that look that says, brother, can, can you run that back again? Oh. Because, you know, they're not very smart. Not a problem. I'll go you one better. I'll show you where I got it from. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. We'll just walk through this verse by verse and line by line. Why? Because I stole that answer. No surprise, you're just taking a claim made in a book of mythology as gospel truth because it fits with your pre-existing religious beliefs and it makes you feel good. It's like saying, I'm right and I wrote a book that says I'm right, thus I'm right. That's not how this works. It's okay, because there's nothing new under the sun. 
I stole it straight from Peter. Just like the early Christians stole a ton of things from pre-existing mythology. Yeah, I know. Shh. Now I realize there are probably some of you in here who've had a semester of philosophy. And I think there ought to be a law. Yes, there ought to be a law that all students are required to take logic and critical thinking classes so they can see right through the idiotic things that people like this guy are preaching. And you notice that whenever something like this comes up, where logic or critical thinking is proposed for early children, who opposes it? The religious. That ought to tell you something. Uh, while we were there in D.C., I went to visit my congressman, a couple other congressmen, you know, and do a little lobbying. and Because separation of church and state isn't a thing. Oh, wait. One of the things that I really would like to see is a law in this country that you cannot talk about if you've had a semester of it. <laughs> if you haven't had any philosophy, you can talk about it all you want. If you've had more than a semester, you can talk about it all you want. But if you've only had one semester of philosophy, there ought to be a law that you have to close your mouth every time a philosophical conversation begins. Haven't had success yet, but I'm still trying. Okay. Well, granted, a lot of people make complete fools of themselves doing that. But to be honest, even philosophy professors go off the reservation and say really stupid things with regards to philosophy. So I guess it's an equal opportunity fool maker. Maybe that's why the religious rely so heavily on it. So you've had a semester of philosophy, and I know what you're saying here. He's like, well, actually, you're about to use circular reasoning because you're trying to use the Bible in order to prove the Bible or defend the Bible. Just be quiet. Because you're getting in the way of a circular reasoning. And it's amazing how many apologists know that what they're doing is wrong Yet they do it anyhow and pretend that they can engage in fallacious logic and everyone else has to just shut up. Sure, tell us another one. I have no intention of defending the Bible. Because you can't and you know it. That doesn't stop you from believing it. I agree with Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who argued it makes no more sense to defend the Bible than it does to defend a lion. You don't defend a lion, you just turn it loose. You just let your emotions go with no intellectual limits because it makes you feel good to think that it's true. But honestly, you need to defend the Bible if you're talking to anyone who doesn't already believe it, which is exactly why so many of these crazy apologists don't talk to anyone outside of their religious safe space. They aren't there to defend their faith, they're there to push it on people who are already convinced. It's easier that way when you don't have to prove that anything you're saying is true. It'll defend itself, amen? It's done a pretty crappy job of it, I'm sorry to say, because the Bible, if you read it as it's written, not as it's constantly reinterpreted by the religious, it falls apart under even the most cursory of evaluation. But again, don't think too hard, just believe. My defense is of my choice to believe the Bible. That, that, that's what I'm talking about here, why I choose to believe. Why you choose to cut your video in the middle of a sentence, like so many other religious apologetic videos do. Quality control, people. Honestly, I want someone to explain that to me, because there are so many religious videos that just cut off in the middle of a thought. They're either completely incompetent, or it means something. And if it means something, I want to know what it means. Let me know what you think in the comments. But really, this is just another example of why religious apologetics are so utterly unimpressive. False claims, outright lies, and the expectation that if you don't agree with him, you have to keep your mouth shut lest you make him and his ilk unhappy. And his line that he isn't going to defend the Bible by reading the Bible because he isn't going to bother defending the Bible at all is downright dumb. Because no matter what he believes, all claims need support. All of them. Every single one. Your blind belief in its validity doesn't make it so. It doesn't impress anyone who doesn't share a similar view. But the apologists know that convincing people who doubt the veracity of the Bible takes work. 
and it takes evidence that they simply don't have. Therefore, for the most part, they don't even try, and on those rare occasions where they do, they fail miserably because they're fighting a battle of wits completely unarmed. If Christianity or any other religion was true, then they wouldn't have such a hard time backing it up. But Christianity is stupid, and so too are its practitioners. It's why the churches are full of the faithful, not the skeptics. Because they've got nothing that would convince us. They have nothing that ought to convince anyone. That's why they're terrified of education. Because they're afraid people will figure out what a sham it all is. And luckily, more and more people are. It's a glorious thing.